Welcome to Colloquium, everyone. Um, it's my privilege to introduce Dr. Eric Wilson, who holds a bachelor's degree in medical laboratory science, a master's degree in parasitology, and a PhD in immunology. He didn't really plan on being a professor, calling it an unplanned, unplanned route, but he never really grew out of what he calls little kid science and was attracted by the idea of having the freedom to study what he wanted. Dr. Wilson is motivated by the desire to understand the immune system, and this has directed his research throughout his 15-year career in the microbiology department at BYU. He started studying the immunology of breastfeeding for this very reason, a curiosity into what happens to the biology of the mother and child during nursing and why. This work seeks to understand the way mothers pass immu immunity to their nursing children, why some women are more susceptible to mastitis or inflammation of the mammary gland, and, what, and which kinds of molecules allow bacteria to infect the mammary gland. His study of breastfeeding has led to several publications, most recently, Genome-Wide Identification of Fitness Factors in Mastitis-Associated E. coli, published in Applied Environmental Microbiology in 2018. Similarly, Dr. Wilson and his students are also researching the feces of wild turkeys, wondering why wild turkeys thrive in harsh conditions while domesticated turkeys are frequently sick. In his free time, Dr. Wilson enjoys anything outdoors, particularly fishing, hiking, and following turkey tracks in the mountains. A recipient of the Alcuin Fellowship in General Education for his work teaching Biology 100, Dr. Wilson loves watching students get as excited about science as he is. Today, he will present novel approaches to identifying bacterial factors causing mastitis in nursing mothers. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Wilson. Thank you. I, I'm, uh, I'm really excited to be here and to talk to you for a couple of reasons. Um, one, um, I, I think a university, the whole idea of a university is to learn about things that you don't know about and to interact with people that are different than yourself. And, and down on the south end of campus, everybody is a lot like me. And, um, and I run into Russian majors and uh, political science majors, but they're all pre-med. Um, and they're all the same in a lot of ways. And uh, so I'm, I'm glad to be here and to tell you a little bit about what I do. If I can get the first slide up that I thought would be there. <laughs> oh, there we go. So I was, looking over, I was looking over the schedule of talks, and I realized that my title was really out of character with the other one. So I changed my title. Um, <laughs> And and it and it is what I'm going to talk about: um, uh, the history of humankind and the fiercest battles ever fought. But I'm going to start by telling you a story, and it's a story that I made up, but it's also a story that is true. And um, this little girl is like billions of other little girls and little boys in that they go outside and they play in the dirt and they run into things and they get sick. And um, most little girls on earth are not like us. Um, they grow up in places where the possibility of dying from an infectious disease is in front of them all the time. Um, very few, if any of you, um, know someone that died from an infectious disease. Uh, that's not normal in the world that we came from or the world of today. And this little girl, um, if she gets exposed to cholera <clears throat> or salmonella or enterotoxic E. coli, any of these pathogens that in infect your intestines, she's going to get really sick. Um, but the, uh, the human immune system is really amazing, and it learns, and it, when, when you or she gets infected with anything, there's a few days where it's kind of this battle between the, the pathogen, the microbe, and you, but after a few days, your immune system starts to figure it out, and it learns what that pathogen looks like, and it learns where in your body that pathogen likes to infect you. And then the next time you get infected, that your immune system is ready to act and to fight and to kill. And um, so when this little girl gets infected with an intestinal pathogen like cholera, she 
her immune system is going to learn to target cholera-specific immune cells to her intestine. And when she's four, after she recovers from cholera, um, if she ever gets infected with cholera again, there's cells coursing through her veins, through the circulation, and when those cells pass her brain, they just pass by. And when they pass her lungs, they pass by. And when they pass by her liver, they pass by. And when they pass by her intestines, they sense that that is where they should be. And they home into the tissues and patrol her intestinal tissues waiting, watching, to see if she ever gets infected with cholera again. And if she does, they kill it quickly. And that's the whole idea about vaccinations, is to expose your immune system and let it learn what a pathogen looks like so that you can kill it if you're exposed to it. Um, so when that little girl is 15, those cells that she developed years ago are still going through her veins, passing by all of her tissues and going to her intestines. And when she's 20, they're doing it. When she's 30, they're doing it. And if she gets pregnant, when she's eight months pregnant, they're still doing it. And when she's nine months pregnant, they're still doing it. And when she gives birth, if she starts to nurse, to breastfeed her baby, within hours, these cells that have passed by her mammary gland tissue for 30 years, all of a sudden start to recognize that that is where they should go to. And these cells, now some of them still go to her intestines to protect her, but some of them now get out of the blood circulation and they crawl through her tissues into the mammary gland and there they make antibodies that are specific to kill intestinal pathogens like cholera and salmonella. This doesn't do the mother any good. But when her baby drinks that milk, that baby is getting immune factors that are specific for intestinal pathogens, and they go right to the baby's intestines. And this, if you're, if you're raised in Provo or Orem or Minneapolis, if you're raised on uh, breast milk or formula, it doesn't matter very much. You'll grow up, and many of you were raised on formula, and many of you are raised on breast milk, but if you live in a third world country <clears throat> where the possibility of disease is always there and you're raised on formula rather than breast milk, the chances of that infant dying go up 50-fold. Not 50%, but 50-fold greater chance of death for a child raised on formula in a third world country versus breast milk. And that's some of that might be to, due to nutrition, but very little of it, because we're pretty good at making formula. But most of that effect is because the immune factors that the mother passes to the baby are very specific for the diseases in that area, the diseases the mom's been exposed to. And, um, and that is literally a life-saving a part of our immune system that doesn't save our own lives, but saves the lives of our kids. Um, <clears throat> so mother's milk provides these nutrients, and that's great, but breastfeeding is risky for the mother. And it's risky because milk is really nutritious, and it's nutritious for us, and it's nutritious for bacteria. And if you've ever had milk go rotten, um, it's because bacteria have figured out how to use the nutrition in that milk and eat it and multiply. And mastitis, or infection, of the mammary gland is a really common disease of motherhood. And it infects mothers of all species. Um, a huge problem in the dairy industry because when cows get infected, they stop producing milk and the, the infection can damage, um, even kill part of the mammary gland, um, and, and sometimes kill the entire animal when it becomes septicemic or the bacteria get out of that tissue and into the blood. And the same thing is true for, for humans. 
Uh, usually mastitis is a really painful, uncomfortable disease, um, but you don't die from it very often. But um, when these bacteria infect um, the mammary gland, it becomes really, really painful and uncomfortable. And a lot of women stop breastfeeding because this is such a terrible experience. If you, if you go home and call your mom and say, did you ever have mastitis when I was a kid? She'll, she'll say either, huh? Or she'll say, that was the worst experience of my life. This is really, and it affects about 30% uh, of nursing mothers. And so um, milk actually, it, Although milk can infect, or bacteria can infect your milk in your fridge, um, nature has kind of designed milk to be, to, to try to essentially hide the nutrients of milk so that y you, your baby, can get those nutrients, but bacteria can't get those nutrients. And um, one of the things that we study in my lab, and is when you when you talk to scientists, um, the kind of the stereotype is they bore you with a lot of graphs and data. And I've tried to kind of talk, uh, plan this talk around the story, rather than around the data. And we'll show a little example of data, but mostly it's just about the story. Um, so one aspect of immunity is cells. There's cells that come in and fight bacteria that eat bacteria, that kill bacteria in a lot of different ways. But one as aspect of human immunity that, that hasn't got a lot of attention until more recently, we call nutritional immunity. And that's where your body hides the nutrients so that the bacteria can't get them. If you can, if you can essentially make it impossible for bacteria to find nutrients, they can't consume that, and then they can't grow and cause disease. So um, here we're back to our battles. So the battle for iron. The battle for iron is actually, is actually one of the fiercest, longest lasting battles that we've ever known. Um, you may be aware that in the First World War, the Second World War, um, more people generally die during war from diseases than, by, than through combat. And this war for the simple nutrient, iron, has been going on for a long, long time. And iron, it turns out, is one of the most important nutrients for bacteria to grow. And your body really tries hard to hide iron and bacteria try really hard to find iron. And when they find it, um, they grow and multiply and cause disease. And when you hide it effect effectively, you stay healthy. Um, don't worry about these pictures at all. The idea is that your body hides iron. There's a lot of molecules in your body, a transferrin is one that you hear about. And a transferrin, the, the purpose of that molecule in your body is to grab iron and hide it. You're always hearing about, you know, you want to eat foods that are iron rich to keep you from getting anemia. Um, when iron comes into your body, your body tries to hide all of that iron so that bacteria can't eat it. There's free iron in your intestines and in the, as food is passing through, but when it comes into your body, into your bloodstream, into your cells, your body tries to mask it, to bind it up, and that keeps bacteria from getting it. If there's free iron floating around in your body, um, bacteria are gonna get that and they're gonna cause disease. So um, what our laboratory does, one of the main projects that we work on, is trying to understand the weapons of war. Um, trying to understand how bacteria fight for iron and how we try to fight for iron and this conflict that happens inside of us. And um, kind of the idea is if you can understand your opponent's weapons, then you can defend yourself against your opponent. <clears throat> so our, the way we do experiments um, is we, we first do grow uh, experiments in media where we simply grow bacteria in broth, in nutrient-rich broth, and try to understand them. 
And then we uh, do experiments in, in milk um, to try and understand these different molecules on a bacteria, how they might react here, what, which ones are important for what. And then we try to see if that's important in milk, because milk is kind of a really cheap, easy model for a diseased mammary gland, because this milk is a really unique chemical environment. And then we uh, do experiments on, on animals, on small animals, and then ultimately, we want to test these experiments in cows, and we hope that eventually something will happen and we'll be able to uh, improve human health. Um, so one thing I just wanted to touch on here is that, um, is that we, we use animals in our research, and, and there's a lot of ethical issues with that. And, um, and one of the things that we work really hard to do is test things um, outside of animals as much as possible so that when you actually have to move into an animal, you're not randomly doing stuff. You have a really good idea of what might work. And you need to test this to find out if it's safe and to find out if it works. But we try to reduce the numbers of animals that we use really a lot by experimenting mostly outside of an animal. Um, so this is kind of, uh, one of the things that we do is try to understand what molecules in milk hold the iron that bacteria use, that bacteria try to steal. And so when we set up an experiment, we'll have media in uh, flasks or test tubes. And in, in one example, we'll have just free iron floating around, rich media. In a negative control, we'll have media with no iron. And then we'll add media that has all of the nutrients you need, except the iron in this flask is 100% bound to an iron-hiding molecule, transferrin. The iron in this flask is all bound to an iron-binding molecule called lactoferrin, which lacto is, is milk. This is the main iron-binding protein in milk. And then... Um, uh, citrate is another protein or another uh, chemical that will bind to iron that our body uses to hide iron. So we'll grow bacteria in these different medias and then see where the bacteria can grow. Hopefully they can grow when there's available iron and hopefully they can't grow when there's no iron. If that works, we know we designed our experiment okay. And then when we start testing these different specific molecules, we look for if no bacteria can grow in this flask, we know that the bacteria aren't able to steal iron from transferrin, but they can from lactoferrin because the bacteria are able to grow there. Um, another thing that we do, and this is, it's so hard to illustrate some of these things in a way that you can see, but uh, bacteria, the bacteria that we use most is a Staphylococcus aureus, Staph aureus, or MRSA, and MRSA has about 2,500 different genes. About 2,500 genes. And we want to understand which genes are important. And so what I've tried to illustrate here is here's a bacteria, and I've put all these little shapes around it. And each of those shapes is supposed to represent a different protein. And so I wasn't able to fit on 2,500 different shapes, so I put about 20. Um, but this is our normal bacteria. One of the things that we do in our lab is we go through and we mutate different genes in the bacteria. So in this mutant one, it has 2,499 genes, but every bacteria in this tube is missing that one gene that's illustrated by that little kind of cylinder there. And so this bacteria is totally normal in every way except it's missing one gene. And this bacteria is totally normal in every way, but it's missing a different gene. And we actually have mutants for all, pretty much all, 2,500 different genes. And by using these in our experiments, we can start to see, well, is gene 2 important in being able to grab that lactoferrin? 
or is gene 3,900? Three, no, I used too big a number. 2,000 <laughs> um, important. So by using these different mutants, we're able to tell exactly which molecules are important. And so, um, so the same thing here, we look for growth or no growth in these different um, mutants. And this is kind of an example of the data that we generate. So uh, most of the, all of this data was generated by a student in my lab named Shaley uh, Carlson. And this, these little shapes here represent different proteins, mutant one or mutant 2000, whatever they happen to be. And uh, these are things that are thought to be important in moving iron out of a cell into a bacteria. And so when she uses these different mutants, we're able to start to piece together what molecules are important. And over here, um, these, this shows how many bacteria grew in the y-axis and time here. And so you can see in these experiments, this mutant right here that is uh, mutated in this specific gene um, cannot utilize human lactoferrin. This gene is important in transporting and getting human and lactoferrin and the iron that it's stuck to into the bacterial cell to allow it to grow. Um, so, so there's no real details on the research there, but that's kind of the general idea of what we do. So uh, what have we learned? Um, we, first, we learned that different bacteria are different. And that sounds really dumb, but it's really true. Um, there's several different bacteria that commonly cause mastitis. And the molecules that they use to bring iron into their bodies, into their cells, are very, very different. And so you can't really just make a cure for mastitis. You can start to make a cure for staphylococcal mastitis or E. coli mastitis. But it's not just a global disease where everything is, is the same. Um, the next thing we learned is different milks are different. And, and this really surprised me because um, you think about milk and it's got fat and it's got proteins and it's got all of this stuff. But when we do experiments in cow milk and experiments in human milk, we get very different results. Some things are important in both types of milk. But some things are very important for a bacteria to be able to infect a cow, and other molecules are very important for a bacterium to be able to infect a human. And so you also can't just come up with a cure that treats all mastitis. You might need to uh, look at things that affect humans and things that affect cows, and many times treat them differently. Um, another thing that we've learned is that acquiring metals is really complex, and it's not a single gene that re is responsible, but it's a whole series of genes that do different jobs to pull this iron into the cells. And, um, and that's, that's most of the message that I wanted to give to you today, was this idea that, a couple of ideas. First, that your immune system is absolutely magical. When I think about the word magic, I think about things that you see with your eyes, but you just can't quite comprehend how that could ever happen. And when I think about a mother whose body has behaved the same way for 35 years, and then within hours of starting to feed her baby, her body changes. And all of a sudden, these cells that have gone to the same tissue for 30 years reroute and go and protect her baby. Um, that's just magical, that's incredible. And your immune system works in a lot of different ways to do this. We have a lot of mechanisms to help you, help protect you. Um, the other thing that I wanted to kind of make sure you understand is that, that we have a lot of tools to use in science. Um, when I was, um, a graduate student, um, people worked for six years on a PhD project, and their project was to sequence a single gene. And, and it took six years of hard work. And um, today, I can sequence 2,500 genes 
in three days for $80. Um, the, the world, the world of molecular biology and genetics and immunology and microbiology has just exploded with tools. But now we, we're using those tools to try to figure out how to fight this war that has gone on and on. And it's hard, and it's expensive, and it's kind of slow, but it's also we're better equipped than we've ever been in our lives. And then my last slide is things to think about. Um, antibiotics. Some of you have heard about antibiotics and antibiotic resistance. Um, there, there's a lot of discussion about the Second World War and what won the Second World War. A lot of people would say that the atomic bomb ended the war. Um, a lot of people would say that penicillin won the war because when when the Allied countries f discovered penicillin and how to make it, they were able to keep their soldiers alive. Um, how many of you were born by cesarean section? How many of you have had any type of surgery? Okay, so penicillin and other antibiotics has probably saved many of your lives. And today, we're losing the ability to use antibiotics. Microbes are evolving and changing and adapting, and most of the antibiotics, penicillin still works on a few organisms, but penicillin doesn't work at all on a lot of organisms that it used to be really effective against. And this is a huge problem. And um, in the, if we don't start to discover new antibiotics, things like a cesarean section will once again become a 50-50 chance of survival. And minor surgeries, cosmetic surgeries, um, will become a thing of the past because, uh, an example, a, a week or two ago my neighbor um, had an eyelid that was sagging down and she couldn't see well. So they did a little surgery, they cut that, they gave her an, an eyelid lift. It wasn't necessarily a cosmetic thing, it's because she, it was impeding her vision. But when antibiotics, and, and she got an infection, she was taking antibiotics, she was following the directions, it got infected. Um, if we don't have antibiotics, surgeries, minor, tiny surgeries become life-threatening surgeries because if you get infected, you can't fight that infection without antibiotics. And we're losing a lot of antibiotics because the bacteria are discovering new tools to fight against them. Um, that's a real issue in the world, and we spend a lot of money on defense in our country and in the world. And I don't know what an appropriate balance is, but, but it's clear that bacterial diseases have caused a lot more deaths than combat in world history, and that they're going to continue to do so. And um, so as you're, as you're in school, I think one thing that we like to do is we all think whatever our individual discipline is, is the most important, the most interesting, or the most vital. And one of the things to remember is that, is that they're all really important and vital in different ways. There's these kind of these unseen threats that are very real. And um, the only way we can combat them is to have knowledge and to have normal people understand these threats and, and play a role in funding and supporting. And it doesn't mean that um, you can't spend money on weapons of war against people, but it has to be balanced in, in this vision of what's important in the world and what's important for, for us to thrive and stay healthy and progress as a people. And, and the only way to do that is to understand the weapons that the enemy uses. And that's kind of the whole idea of our research and the research of most microbiologists is how do these microbes work how do they steal iron? How do they steal manganese? How do they survive? And you know, when you think about, um, I went to a talk about how 
pathogens acquire metals, and that's just, it sounds boring because it is. But when you think about what it means in the long term, is it, is it means that we can treat infections. We can change our world and the world for our children uh, through this kind of research. And so um, there's my, uh, my talk for today. There's the ideas. And um, I'd be happy to take any questions about uh, any aspects of the research or just um, immunology or vaccination and antibiotics in general. Thanks. Dr. Wilson has offered um, insightful research today about the prevalence of mastitis and how it can affect breastfeeding women. We're all grateful for your commitment in furthering scholarship in women's health and potentially finding a treatment or vaccine that targets the mastitis causing bacteria. Thank you for also mentioning the amazing ability mothers have to pass immunity to their babies through breast milk. When our society usually thinks of breasts, the word life-saving most often doesn't come to mind. But you have taught us that a woman's breast milk can literally save a baby's life. While bottle feeding in the United States or other developed countries won't have that big of a difference than breastfeeding because back, um, uncontrolled diseases are not widespread. A baby dying in a developing country is 15 times, 50 times higher, like you mentioned. This research is vital information for anyone here in this room who's contemplating becoming a healthcare professional working overseas or becoming involved with international development agencies. While we don't ever want to bottle shame, it is good to be aware of what matters and where it matters when it comes to human life. It is interesting that many people study mastitis in cows, but not in humans. Since the dairy industry is losing billions of dollars to cow producing milk with bacteria, that are bad or not producing milk at all, people are interested in knowing how to prevent it. The world finds it important because there's money on the line. Dr. Wilson, one of the few people who study this infection in humans, which happen to all be women, has been a wonderful example to us for prioritizing women's health. Dr. Wilson said in our meeting prior that he didn't think people would understand or necessarily care about this topic unless the science major themselves. He also said that his goal would be for us to walk out saying, wow, I didn't know that. That was interesting. I think I can speak on behalf of everyone in the room that you accomplished your goal. Thank you so much for coming out to meet and speak with us this afternoon. Okay, thank you again so much, Dr. Wilson, for your presentation. That was amazing, very fascinating. Um, so we are going to do a Q&A now. Um, we are going to start with the first Q&A question. Uh, Gabby's going to give that question. And after we give our question, we'd like for all of you who have questions to line up by the microphone. And we will go to there. Okay. So we'll kick this Q&A off by um, asking how you got involved in researching mastitis. What like sparked your interest? <laughs> um, that's, a, that's a great question, and um, I wish I had a great answer for it. Um, when I when I started um, when I finished my PhD, I was starting to uh, work as a postdoctoral fellow, needed a research program, and at the time my wife was was pregnant um, with our first uh, first child, and. Um, and uh, I think that played part of a, ro a role in, in this, it, like thinking about this whole aspect of immunity that I'd never really thought about before. And, um, and uh, part of it was based on, huh, I don't think anybody knows that. I can work on it. And part of it was based on, huh, that actually kind of pertains to me and my family now. I can work on that. Hi, Dr. Wilson. Uh, my name is Kaya. I'm a poli sci major and a global women's studies minor. Um, and I um, personally am really curious about how this would affect women on a global scale. And so I wanted to know, um, you mentioned that there, that 
penicillin and lots of antibiotics are losing their effectiveness here in the United States. Um, are we seeing that type of effect happening globally, or do you find that antibiotics are more effective in third world countries? No, these, these problems are gl all global. And, um, and when penicillin was discovered, um, there was a couple of years where it worked great. Mm -hmm. And then um, within about three years, we started to see bacteria that weren't killed by penicillin anymore. And um, now, um, almost no staph species are killed by penicillin. Mm. And um, in the history of microbiology or, or uh, antibiotics, there's been four or five major new kinds of antibiotics discovered. And um, so penicillin and ampicillin, they're very similar. They're the same type with little twists. But every time you discover a new type, it, we've got about two to three years mm. before resistance builds up. But, and when that resistance happens, it covers the globe in no time at all. And one of, the, one of the huge problems, which isn't really the point of this talk, but it is a really big problem, is agriculture mm. has found that if they feed antibiotics just to their cows or chickens when they're not sick, they just feed antibiotics, they gain weight faster. And that's really good if you're trying to produce meat, but it is a, thought to be a huge factor in generating resistant oh. organisms. Okay, thank you. Hi, Dr. Wilson. Um, my name is Bryn. I am also a political science major and women's studies minor. Um, I had a question about uh, nutritional immunity. I thought that concept was really interesting um, about how our bodies like hide those essential nutrients. And I was wondering if there are some people who, who naturally their bodies don't do that as well, if diseases like this are more, are more common for some people, perhaps in some areas of the world, or if, the, if trends show there. Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. And we, um, so nutritional immunity, this idea of, of kind of molecules that hide these nutrients, um, if your body is defective in any of those, you probably die really, really young. Um, but there's, um, there's also many, many other aspects of your immune system, and clearly some people just don't get sick as often. And some women never get mastitis, and some women get mastitis over and over and over again. And one of the things, a uh, different topic that we're working on is what makes some people different in this one specific area where, where their immune system is different, not necessarily in the, their nutritional immunity, but the types of cells or other molecules they make to fight these diseases. Interesting. Thank you very much. Hi. Um, I had a question about uh, supplementing milk. Um, uh -huh. So considering the risks of like some supplements, uh, would you recommend breast milk donations? And with that, would the donations need to come from an area with similar diseases and therefore similar antibodies? Yeah, great. Another really good question. And, um, and so breast milk is really good for babies for a lot of different reasons. And so there's um, mother's milk banks here in Utah County where women can donate and then that milk is donated to ICU units and different places to feed uh, babies that, whose mothers can't produce milk. And, and that is way better than not mother's milk. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to the immune part of mother's milk, um, that isn't a really important aspect of the mother's milk in Orem. And we have ways to donate mother's milk here. It is a very important part of mother's milk in Bangladesh, and they don't have really good ways to share mother's milk in these poor places. So, um, so yeah, using, donating milk and using it is a great thing. It's, it's like donating blood. It saves people's lives. But for the, for the immune part of, of mother's milk, you really need it um, in, in poor countries, and that's where we have the fewest facilities to try and do something like that. Thank you. Hi, my name is Pam Love, and I'm a family studies major, and my question might take you a little bit 
off topic, but I'm really interested in learning more about like the role of iron in the body mm -hmm. and anemia, how that impacts things. Also, you mentioned um, this role that iron plays in the intestines. And mm -hmm. just I'm wondering if you could d share a little bit more about that, if you if that lies within your area of expertise. Um, and if it doesn't, that's fine. Yeah, I know, I know a little bit about that okay. and not very much. That's OK. Um, um, when I was a student, um, in my working on my master's degree, there were two really well-known professors on campus. And one of them was a biochemist who had spent his whole career trying to convince people that iron supplements were killing children. And the other one was a professor who had worked his whole career trying to make iron supplements. <laughs> and, and, um, and and iron is, is essential in so many different parts of your body. And, um, and the, there's a, a really important, so when you eat iron, your body takes that up. Once that iron gets out of the inside of your intestines and into your body, then it's all hidden. There's essentially no free iron. So I, I think now that people don't worry so much about excess iron causing disease, unless you've got a few uncommon diseases where that really is a problem. So uh, supplemented iron and eating iron-rich foods is great, and it's essential, but it doesn't m make you more susceptible because, to disease because all of that iron is naturally hidden and bound away from any Okay, any so pathogens. supplements, you're say, are you saying that maybe we would not want to use uh, unnatural supplements? Uh, so, uh, um, so supplements means a lot of th different mm -hmm. things to different people. Um, for a lot of people, a supplement is, is at Albertsons on this mm -hmm. certain rack. Um, generally, those things are very untested and unproven. Okay. Um, I think re a good, really good supplement is things like broccoli. Mm. <laughs> Sounds good to me. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Hi, my name is Riley Caton, and I'm a nursing major. So I've studied a little bit about breast milk and some of this stuff, but I was under the impression that the antibodies are mostly in the first bit of the milk, like the colostrum, mm -hmm. I think is how you say it. Mm -hmm. um, have you seen that it extends to the remainder of breast milk as well, or yeah. just that first couple days milk? Yeah, so when a, when a woman first gives birth, the very first milk, they call it colostrum, and it, it's very different than the other milk. It look, just looking at it, it looks different. It looks almost more like serum from blood. And what, what has been found is that colostrum contains a ton of antibodies. And... Um, but all through lactation, there's different types of antibodies. So first you get this big bolus, this big mass of antibodies, and they're against a lot of different things. But over time, it, that milk always has these antibodies to these intestinal pathogens, and that lasts as long as you nurse. Thank you. Yeah.